imagine a guy of uh, X who has 21% support, and then there are can be A, B, C, D, E, each of them having 15%, whatever it is, so to sum up 200. And a voter of candidate A would be happy, uh, would be okay to vote for candidate B or C or D, but not just candidate X. But nevertheless, X is available. That's a major weakness, and, and the result you can see in the US with the vote of with the result of which uh, US president was voting. Um, Czech Republic proportional voting system. I already talked about it. It is not good. It is not working. Uh, it's, it is uh, the the parties, um, uh, the uh, extremist party, populist parties are having advantage. You can see all over Europe and you know, over the rise of populism, extremism. Another, a little better version is uh, maybe uh, some of you who you know about voting system, single transfer vote, or also ranked voting score in the US. It is, um, one could say, that it's the best voting system that is being used uh, uh, in politics. Uh, so and it's like, for example, in Australia or Ireland. So we can argue that it's the best voting system that is being used in active politics. Nevertheless, Given the complexity of the system, it is actually not good. It is quite bad, in fact. Okay, I, we want to go to details here, but uh, please take my word for it. We can discuss it later. Another upgrade, much better voting system, is uh, um, what uh, actually I designed in the year 2012. And here in the Czech Republic, I even started a movement, it was called Positive Evolution, to promote the changes in voting system. And this voting system is based on the vote against, on the minus vote. It was a voting system designed against corruption. So, uh, how does this work? And uh, I just said it because it relates to the next version. So, it, it is a voting system for the parliament that you have so-called two c voting districts. So two people win, not one, it's not a majority system, but two people win. And each voter has naturally two votes for, you can vote for two people, and you can vote against one person. And it is a system which will be very useful for, for corruption. Okay, so that's, that's it. It's not, it's, it's a, just a theoretical concept, but it is not the uh, big change, uh, even though it would be an improvement compared to current voting system. The voting system is uh, 2.1 versus 2.1. Now we are doing upgrade. Imagine that you are uh, upgrading from DOS to Windows, or from DOS to Unix, if you wish. And uh, the, actually the system was called Democracy 21, but for various reasons, uh, also for universal applicability, we decided to change the name, and we now call it uh, Yanichek method based on uh, the author. So how does it work? <laughs> how does it work? So imagine that you are voting, uh, just to illustrate a very simple example, you are voting for to go in a restaurant. And there are here there are people who are voting who need to decide uh, where to go for this task after a conference, where to discuss global issues. And they have uh, choices of restaurant uh, uh, of different, uh, different um, nations, right? And yes, each person votes for his or her, her restaurant, so one person, one vote. Except <coughs> McDonald is for some reason getting two votes. You can vote, uh, call these people extremes or whatever, in political context, it's, here, it's not a good example. But uh, just somehow, uh, those two people unite on McDonald's. And thus, by based on this rule, the whole group knows, needs to go for the McDonald's. Now, um, the result, uh, you can imagine, is not very satis satisfactory. In fact, uh, we can easily imagine that from the um, view of maximizing the global utility of all these people, of the society, this might be the worst choice. And can, you, can I please ask about uh, time? If, uh, if you could uh, tell me like uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, five minutes. How long? Okay. What are you so? Okay. So, um, so this might be the result of the first pass the post system. Uh, it could happen. Now, uh, what is uh, Janicek's method? Janicek's method is that because there is one winner, one winning restaurant, each person has two votes. Okay. So, uh, so, um, um, so now we can see uh, the change what happens. McDonald doesn't get any additional votes, 
But other restaurants get the second vote of people. So we have a completely new winner. And this, this, this is a very simple example, but uh, let me say, uh, if you do the analysis and stuff, this simple, just incredible simple thing has absolutely amazing effects, surprising effects uh, of, of, to those who see for the first time. So this is, uh, this is the effect, effect of multiple votes. The fact that you, are, you have the option to vote for your second choice. So uh, the, the, the effect of being able to find consensus, to find a choice which is, a, a, uh, which is uh, interesting, which is motivating for more people. Now, if we can have the option, uh, the option from, uh, from the uh, anti-corruption voting system, as I mentioned at the beginning, is the vote against. So, so the full version of the Janicek method is uh, multiple votes, that each voter has more votes than the winning options, and also a vote against. So here we can see that the result, if we have vote against, then actually the first choice of McDonald would be uh, actually end up negative. So this was... Um, uh, Introduction to the voting system, and I will uh, say in a moment just uh, have one more argument why it is uh, so uh, so um, powerful. But before I do that, let me uh, let me uh, mention uh, the future, the future of democracy, the future for us, what we can do, and uh, one of the futures what I believe help us uh, on the path towards the, the better world, towards the human 21 society, uh, are the so-called social games, where we use technologies, we use the internet, we use our ability uh, to communicate. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to realize uh, several things. We need to take assumptions. One assumption is access to technologies for everybody, okay? or at least most people. So we must have free access to the internet. If we have a country which is dictatorship, like North Korea, and people don't have access to technologies, then uh, we are lost, then we, we cannot solve that. So, but uh, assuming that we have the access to technologies, we have this amazing things of today, uh, which is, I believe, a major part of the process, and that's decentralized computing power. For example, blockchain technologies. What does it mean? It means that we have, we have access to the technologies, the computing power is decentralized, and we are able to behave completely independently and objectively by using uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, and the applications, as you know, are cryptocurrencies, for example. And yes, here it's, you can see directly that this cannot be abused, that this is decentralized. And the only way to hack Bitcoin, Bitcoin would be to get over 50% of the capacity, uh, computing capacity of the world. So it's not uh, feasible. So the same way you can use these technologies for people to express their opinion, for people to vote. And uh, uh, this uh, voting, what we can start running, and which we already did, and I will mention in a second, uh, uh, I call it social games. Uh, one important aspect of the world is the ability to have data anonymization, that people will be able to express their opinion without, um, without uh, prosecution. That's very important. Uh, this, uh, this data analysis is, of course, it's, a, it's a, uh, not a very non trivial thing, but in principle, we are able to do it uh, nowadays. We can all have our private key and have independent and anonymous and objective access to technologies to voting, which cannot be manipulated. This is very important, right? It's a historical thing. Because in the past, anybody. Uh, wanted to, uh, people to express opinion, or uh, uh, governments or dictators could manipulate data, could manipulate information, control information. Uh, you did not have the guarantee of anonymity. You did not, you never knew if, if uh, what you are reading, uh, of course, you know, no, fake news and stuff, but uh, nothing was, uh, nothing could be guaranteed to be objective. But yet, these modern technologies, thanks to technology type of blockchain, uh, we do have uh, guaranteed, uh, guaranteed fairness and uh, objectivity. And now the, the social game. Example of the social game, uh, the check between you probably know, a voting game, President 21. But what is it? The idea here is, before we go and become completely objective by using blockchain technologies, we can, uh, we can uh, start uh, social games 
which are not yet 100% guaranteed to be objective because this social game that ran in the Czech Republic was done by, uh, by my NGO. So yes, I could uh, or we could probably hack it and influence, but why would we do that, right? But in principle, it's the first step to uh, motivate people, to um, attract them to play, to express their opinion. And President 21 was a good voting game where people were for over one year, a little bit over one year, they were able to vote for Czech president, to nominate candidates and vote for the Czech president. And the game was very successful. Uh, uh, so here is uh, some results. Uh, we had uh, over 300, uh, almost 330,000 uh, people voting using over one million votes because each voter could give more votes. Uh, people were nominated, nominated, we had over 600 candidates in the first part of the game. In the second part, only the official candidates could be, uh, could be uh, uh, running. And we had big, uh, almost 3 million visitors, uh, in the, as, as you can see. I mean, in the Czech Republic, uh, the, the eligible voters are like, I think, 7 million. Uh, the participation is uh, less than half or, uh, half or so. Uh, so uh, this is actually a very high percentage of people who participated. And how was the voting based on? Voting for Czech president, one winner. And the other Czech president, what does it mean? That means that each person can vote for two or even three people. More votes than more candidates. In the game, we were voting for up to three people. So every, every uh, voter or every uh, Czech citizen uh, could use three votes. First, second and third. Each of them having the same base. Okay. So uh, three votes and one vote against. And you can see, uh, uh, you can see the results. First, I thought we will we will see uh, only one vote. So, if there was only one vote, uh, this is Zeman, this is Drahoc. Our the 330,000 people, of course, were not a uh, representative sample. Although we had, uh, we could have a representative sample out of that, but that's not important because our vote was not to be a representative sample. But, but we have uh, out of those people. Drahoš was the winner, and our current president Zeman was second, because it was not representing sample, right? But he was second, you can see he was the second strongest. Uh, in the real election, Zeman actually was the first. So now, uh, this is only using one vote, one vote, one minute. Now, look at the effect of multiple votes. What happens if you can use second and third vote, Zeman from his uh, second place drops to fifth place. Why? Because it's not a consensual candidate, it's a person separating society. So he didn't get any second or third vote. As you can see, just very few second and third votes. On the other side, a guy who was fixed, a young guy uh, who was fixed here, with the effect of multiple votes, actually jumped to second place. You can see he had many second and uh, 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 third votes. So uh, this example, these data, these objective data, uh, illustrate, perfectly illustrate the effect of multiple votes. What happens if people can have other votes? What, what happens if uh, we are motivated towards consensus and uh, towards finding a common candidate? Um, the effect of uh, multiple votes is uh, absolutely crucial. It's much more important than the minus vote, the vote against. Let me just illustrate one more example. What will happen if in a real election we have a young Czech matter voting for the Czech president and each person has two or three votes, and let's say just two votes, how will the pre-election campaign look like? Imagine that you have uh, 12 candidates and you are one of the serious candidates. What will you do? Will you be against your opponent? Not exactly the opponent, uh, opposite. You need to appeal uh, to, uh, to also to voters of your opponents because you want to get a second vote of, of other people. You cannot win just by having only the first vote. So what will you do? You will find uh, in your opponents the ones which are closest and you will promote them. So you will say, okay, so candidate B is actually very good, I like his program, but my program is even better. Right? And why? And you give the reason. So pre-election campaign will be constructed, will be exactly the opposite of, of what is happening in uh, uh, today's society. And I need, to, uh, I need to finish, I don't have time, so uh, two minutes if I may. Uh, so let me just one more idea because you are very advanced people here. Uh, so 
the technologies in India again, new technologies enable new society, and let me tell you just how. K21. You can see uh, there's Bhutan on the background, it's a kingdom. Kingdom 21. Uh, well, we can have a system which is uh, where, where the uh, king is ruling, which is in some sense democratic. How? Uh, then because people can play the official, not in this one social game, but they can play uh, uh, decentralized. So we may have a country where there is one leader, uh, where there is one king, and yet the country is in some sense in second degree democratic because if the leader becomes, uh, if people can see that the leader is a dictator, that he is he's bad, they might have in their constitution the ability uh, to run a social game and express their opinion. Express their opinion not as a referendum, yes or no, but uh, I don't have time for that, but uh, there is a term called, which I call referendum 21 that people can express on scale of preferences. So, uh, this is too fast, perhaps, but let me say that there are, uh, uh, I have developed some theories how a society can function uh, even, even when uh, the country has, a, has a one rule, how it can be more efficient. Similarly, we can have so-called P21. P21 is party. So, we might have a country which is led by uh, some oligarchy, but yet the country might be in control of people through the technologies, so that they can express objectively their opinions. Uh, D21 is Democracy 21, and that's, you can see, that's the top, where people have multiple votes, where they vote for, uh, for parliament uh, using the energy method. And the ultimate is H21. H21 is, uh, you can see, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the base of our uh, existence, right? Uh, the, one of the base of our physical existence, H20. H2O, that's how we got to go. But the next level is H21, and you can understand it as being the, our mental energy, our ability uh, to be in the space. Because our life is now not just us, physically here, but it's also the cloud. So H21 is the energy in, in our space, in our universe, and let's let us all uh, connect and use it properly and come to the world of Human 21. Thank you. really exciting that we get a chance to uh, use kind of a, a, a mini version of, of this technology in our, in our uh, uh, voting tournament, Democracy 21 uh, vote. Hopefully you've all had a chance to do that and we'll learn about the results uh, at the next break, I believe. Um, so next we'll have a presentation uh, from Jan Kukal, uh, former mayor of Prague and former ambassador of the Czech Republic to Austria. Um, we have about uh, 10 minutes for each of the next presentations and then we'll have about 15 uh, for discussion at the end. Thank you. Good afternoon. You see that I will start with the uh, HO, the water. <laughs> so, slightly going back, in fact, I have to admit that uh, uh, my original profession was mathematical physics. So, in that sense, uh, as you saw in the previous presentation, the artificial intelligence is just applied mathematics and we are happy about that and it will be the driving force. I'm slightly joking. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> but anyhow, it's explanation about my voting in previous words for discussion. Uh, what I'd like to show is something else uh, because I was asked to, to present something which is a global problem and uh, with a lot of uh, possible technologies which we do have now and which might uh, even be better and better uh, but um, basically they exist we can solve something which will be part of our vision for solving energy, solving the problem with water and uh, to achieve something which is quite understandable because what I feel also during that discussion that uh, uh, there is a fair from artificial intelligence and that is something which I, I guess we can we can show that uh, it is very useful and positive type of development for uh, <coughs> humanity and I feel that uh, uh, my contribution is, is really basically very positive I will that is a one that is a main topic but I will show you also the, the international institutions dealing with that 
And at the end of the at the end of that presentation, you know, one example of of uh, implementation, let's say, still not existing. Maybe that now I will. Yeah. So the main problem is is water. How we we we, we can get water? It's it's practically the only thing that it's rain. And we should realize that we. Where it is? Yeah. So we have basically that amount of cubic kilometers, half million cubic kilometers of water falling down due to precipitation. And uh, what we do have as an average amount of water globally is practically uh, one meter. <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> One meter per uh, every square millimeter globally. Uh, if if I try to, to see um, from the from my main team the second part that was three, I can see that uh, economists in 2005 or even even the the, the well known and the top scientific uh, journal Nature was slightly against three and against the rule of trees in, in protecting water and uh, if I will go to Fukuyama who was uh, not really mentioned today but somebody was asking why it is not so so I made uh, one citation uh, in Francis Fukuyama book uh, America in the UK he was criticizing the, the US Forest Service institution as the as the example of something which was at the very beginning very positive, uh, but uh, nowadays uh, everybody is talking about abolishing that absolutely. Uh, I will not um, link that with, uh, with the nowadays situation in, in California, but anyhow, you see that um, it's, it's a bit conflicting uh, sort of for consideration about. about uh, uh, shouting enough. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry. So, it is a slightly conflicting issue how the, how the water and trees can be together and uh, whether trees will really help us to, to protect the civilization uh, <coughs> by, uh, by keeping up enough water for us. So, our project is, is slightly opposing all these, these information which are against that uh, to a type of uh, climate problems and we will not really concentrate ourselves of uh, usually uh, main subject it's uh, CO2 and the temperature effect on our climate change because if you will ask for grant any grant agency and you will not mention CO2 you will probably not get money but still we, we like to focus on, on the influence of vegetation to water content and in, on Earth. Now, if I will succeed, yeah. The, the theory which is behind that consideration is smart biotic pump. And uh, you might notice that uh, the institution dealing with that is against Czech Institute for Informatic Robotic and Kibernetics that was presented by Professor Mazik. We are trying to be, yeah, uh, in that direction. Uh, in that institution as soon as possible and I am coming from Yasa Luxembourg, uh, Austria. You see how many institutions are in, in that uh, um, problematic already involved before uh, we form form uh, what's a smart biotic pump platform and we have uh, uh, nuclear physics institute from Russia, we have uh, institutions from Brazil, uh, Germany, Israel, so it's very international community dealing with that program, regardless of the fact that we do not talk about any any special CO2 effects on, on our climate. The main team, or really we are trying to get the support, is in agenda of the United States, the United Nations, 2030 agenda, which adopted uh, 70 sustainable development goals, which you already have. Uh, yesterday about that, those are these, these goals and our water is let's say here 
and biodiversity forest uh, desertification is here. I'm coming from an institution which is strongly supporting that, uh, that type of consideration and we found that the space for us, I mean it's, uh, it's something like CERN institution which was presented uh, yesterday. It's interesting because we had a political practical argumentation. I have to start with the history because the ASA institution, which is now uh, some sort of brainstorming institution, was formed really due to political uh, debate which were uh, caused by, by the conflict, by the Cold War. And in uh, 72, it was created by 10 countries, partly from one side, partly from the other side. Czech Republic was in between those uh, Czechoslovakia, pardon, and, uh, that time in, in between these 10 countries. But the, the, the main problem is that there was practically uh, war between two, two parts of the world, that was United States and that time Soviet Union. And they decided to use science as something which will break that, that uh, or will create a bridge between these two parts and will somehow simplify the debates and discussion uh, what and how to develop and to tackle the basic, uh, basic problems or agendas for sustainable development in, in our society. It is very interesting that science is, is always playing some, some sort of bridge role and maybe it comes back to that problem that science again is something which is opening the debate without any, any, any problem uh, discussing with, uh, b between people from any part of, of the world, any nation. There are no borders. Science is, is international. Uh, that, is, that is practically the, the <coughs> basic property or how can I uh, express that. And for that reason in 72 that was used that YASA is now tackling these global problems and there are six major transformations which, uh, which we are considering there. Uh, you see that it's not really seven main goals which are um, uh, here discussed, but it is practically the, the, the agenda of World 2050 and uh, sustainable development in all these six, six areas. To it's, it is just one, one small interesting uh, information that Nobel Prize winner for economics this year started at YASA and that was uh, first publication in, uh, uh, in uh, interacting climate change into long run macroeconomic analysis and that was, uh, that was the work of, of Nobel Prize winner for this year. The system of thinking in, in, in IASA is, is a system solution for sustainable transformations. It means that we, we do have ten, 10 branches of our research. One of those is, is naturally related uh, to energy, world population, water, ecosystems, uh, global health, and that, that's the structure, the research in that institution is running. That institution actually, and that is, that is my subject and, and, and our emphasis, is a water program which is one of those 10 term branches, which is strongly supported from, from YASA side. I should say that YASA is, is, is quite near to, uh, to us because it's uh, 30 kilometers from, uh, from Vienna and it's an international institution where we do have contact with about 5,000 senior scientists all over the world and uh, practically in, any, in any, any state we do have uh, mm, not hundreds but mostly thousand co-workers, young students, PhD, PhD students and that might be inter uh, interesting information for you if you are working in one of those 10, 10, 10 subjects. So, back to that reality. I would need two more minutes. One and a half? Oh, speed up. The biotech pump is something which was uh, 
developed um, uh, or the theory, and it's really theory, it's a mathematical theory, describing slightly uh, the, 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 the air and the, the, the movement of, of moisture. Uh, it, it's just a more complicated system which we learn in the basic school. And you can see that, uh, uh, that uh, trees are helping to move moisture from, from ocean to, to airs. And that is a basic idea of uh, a biotic pump. You can see that if you have a, a situation like that, uh, systematically you have a higher temperature on, <coughs> on, <coughs> on ground and you have a lower temperature uh, in, in places where you have uh, trees, roots and, and so on. And this is a natural sort of movement then, then of, uh, of moisture and you will keep the moisture falling down on, on earth and not back to the, to the, to the ocean. <coughs> we, we have a project which is a real implementation of, the, of, of these theories and of the, the, uh, the whole systematic work in IASA and that is uh, to support Dead Sea from Red Sea by the channel which is, uh, uh, which is uh, <coughs> finally uh, 500 kilometers of water corridors but they are practically two corridors so basically we have the two to uh, 100 kilometers of basic corridor, and we will, we will uh, with that theory and with that application uh, and uh, the, the overall uh, implementation of, of these ideas, we can create a program which will really from from Arab Gulf Red Sea bring the water to Dead Sea and um, have the the also the great energy gain and will bring also life and will will solve a lot of problems uh, in that desert area where we will be able to accommodate two million people at the end of the day. It's a project for 200 to, to <coughs> 20 years, let's say, and um, it, it will last, but uh, it looks like something which, which you can't imagine if you look just on this scheme. Nobody would immediately understand what I'm talking about. But anyhow, it is a realistic project which is which just started to be implemented. At the very beginning, we had a theoretical interpretation of water circle, and at the end, we do have something which which will be and will start as as a real thing. So that is why I believe that science and research is working to change our world and will bring something very positive even to that desert where at the moment nobody lives. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to take a seat here. Um, our last uh, panelist uh, for this session um, is Esther Nakajigo. Um, who is a fantastic individual and has such an interesting um, background and so many amazing projects that she's running and uh, we've heard a, a little bit about some of those um, this morning if you were uh, here for the, the Redefiner Spotlight um, and uh, time to you, we've got uh, 10 minutes. Woo Thank you very much. Um, I have a little problem, my English, I'm not sure if my English is so good. So if you can hear me, clap once. Is that once? If you can hear me, clap twice. I'm speaking the English, you know. So today I'm going to tell you about Lyft. Lyft is my baby. It's my reality TV show. Lyft stands for living in the face of trauma. It's a reality TV show for refugee women. You'll ask me, why refugee women? Ask me. I'll tell you. <laughs> so it's refugee women because one day, uh, I'll brag a little, I was 
named Uganda as ambassador for women and girls when I was 17, and my mother is super proud. So my first task was in the world's largest refugee settlement because the settlement has 86% of its population being women and children. So it was my first assignment. And reaching this refugee settlement, uh, I met a couple of people with very sad stories, but that was an outstanding story. And uh, was of a teacher who, when war broke out in South Sudan, was in class. She was sexually abused in front of her students, and she was forced to flee, not looking back home, but walking straight to the border out of Sudan. And I met her in the settlement. She says she does not know if her husband died. She, didn't know, she does not know where her children are. Her children were also in school when war broke out. So she's just a being who is simply hopeless, I would say. And there are many of these people because the settlement has over 1.5 million people. Now, when I was in this settlement, I was so depressed and so sad that I literally did not do what took me there, but listen to stories and stories of women and children, yeah? And it was a two-day trip. So I went back to campus and at campus, we were working on this project, fortunately, and we were uh, coming up with initiatives uh, on how to deal with migration. And surprisingly, in my class, I have brilliant classmates who have these ideas of, you know, building robots and, you know, building water pumps that will change the world and, you know, trying to transform the world in the most magnificent way ever. And this is when it all hit me. You know, we have a very big resource. I always say youth are my biggest resource. So these people have all these ideas, very magnificent, but they are all on paper and in laptops and, you know, in libraries. So I thought, what could I do? I mean, I'm so poor, I, I can't help these women in the settlement. And in the settlement where they came to seek refuge, they still have to hustle every day to fend for themselves because in this place you're given just a portion of food and you don't know where you're going to get your next meal. You don't have shelter to, you know, have by yourself. So I was thinking, how could I help these women? And when I talk to my fellow students, I, because they know I work on TV and everyone wants to be on TV. I love TV. So I promised them that we could work together. Let's go to the settlement and anyone who does something, you're going to be interviewed on TV. I'll interview you, I'll host you, and we'll see what you do. And people had these brilliant ideas. I'm going to build a water pump. I'm going to come up with this, whatever. And when we went to the settlement, everyone broke down. There was literally much they could do. But also one problem we faced was we have this issue of wanting to solve problems when we don't actually know what is happening, we don't listen. So how you're like, oh my God, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a community in Africa and they're so hungry and they don't have food, but then they live on this very fertile land. What happened? You know, I'll just go there and just buy them seeds and give them this, you know, you pretend you know what people need. So when we got to the settlement, we had to actually live with these refugee women to find out what their problems were. So now people who went to build water pumps started calling people back home to at least send us a few doctors, a few psychologists to talk to these women. You know, they did not have water, but they needed more psychological help than just water. So to cut the long story short, Lift is a reality TV show where university students move into a settlement, a refugee camp, live with the refugee women for 15 days as they create, innovate, and try to change lives of refugee women. They are tasked not to get external funding from UN or other agencies, that's the rule, but through their university, through their channels, they have to come up with resources to build the most reliable project 
to better lives of, our, of refugee women. And it's a competition on TV. So the best university is given an award at the end of the season. That was just something I put in to make it more interesting. I started with just five universities, and right now the show is hosting over 20 universities. See why I say youth are a resource? We've set up over 200 projects in BDBD, Uganda's largest refugee settlement, and they are very sustainable. And <coughs> right now on my list, I have universities from Kenya, from Tanzania, who want to be on that show. Why? Because young people love being on TV. I told you I love being on TV. <laughs> so I believe young, young people, you love being on TV, right? I know we all want to be Drake and Nicki Minaj. So this is my innovation, and youth are my technology. So I don't want to bore you. I know we had a long day. But I want to thank you very much for your audience. And one last word I want to leave to all of you. I believe in small interventions. I know small interventions can make big change, big mega change that can even supersede big UN grants and all the monies we, you know, we pour out in Africa to see the Africa you want to see or we pour out in governesses, wherever. These people, these young people are the change we seek. So let's put them at the forefront. Let them be active participants in decision making and policy building. They are the change, they are the tomorrow, hey? So thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, we're just going to reassemble the chairs up on the stage and then uh, we'll uh, all um, convene as you will come on to the stage. And we have uh, 10 minutes for questions. Do we have the Slido? Uh, perfect, okay. Uh, so feel free to submit um, a question on the, the Slido app if you haven't done so yet. Um, so this, uh, this panel may be one of the, the, the widest ranging, um, uh, broadest selection of speakers, but I think that's very appropriate given the, the title of the next 100 Global. And I found it fascinating that um, we really covered, um, in fact, the entire Earth system with the discussion of water governance. Um, we discussed uh, the, the political system and the really important challenges that, that we face um, in terms of uh, electoral reform and, and upgrading. I really liked that. I hadn't thought of um, electoral reform as a, as a kind of upgrading before. That's fascinating. And then we talked about the real um, human experience that, that is infused in all of this. Um, uh, trauma and uh, refugees, uh, migration, and the need to uh, pay attention um, to, to the really individual um, experience of, of folks, uh, even as we work to um, upgrade and reform systems and, and manage really uh, earth-level problems. So let's take a look at the questions here. Several votes to one person. Um. So, uh, thank you for the question. No, it is very crucial that there is only one vote per one person. If you could give more votes to one person, then it would completely destroy the process because then the extremists, the point is that imagine a voter who is extremist and how do we define extremists? Extremist voter would be somebody who votes only one person and nobody else. Right? No consensus. So, if this person could give all votes to this one person, this uh, extremist would have the same voting power. But the point is that, uh, that somebody who is consensual, is democratic, can get his second or third vote to somebody else, and the extremist doesn't want to use his second and third vote. So that, that's, that's an important aspect. So, uh, so again, only one poll by one person, and also all votes have the same date. That's also important. Thank you for the, the clarification. Um, we have a question here. Um, thank you. This question is also for Karel. That was a, a very interesting presentation. I was wondering, in your model, who would write these questions? How have you come up with the important questions for this form of democracy? Uh, so, so you mean, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, the, the, the project of asking uh, questions uh, for people globally? 
Right, yeah, like the question. Yeah, how, well, okay, this is, this is the thing. Yeah, that, uh, yes, uh, actually, we are preparing a project of, called Question 21, where we want to ask a global question and to, to help people, to uh, motivate people to participate, to communicate. And what question to ask? That's the big problem. Yeah, and we are in, in the progress for the next uh, year and a half. Our objective is to find what questions should be there and what should be answers, uh, what should be the possible answers. So, there will be one question. And there will be multiple options to answer and to prepare that this will be a very delicate uh, and important issue. You could, for example, ask a simple question. If you had additional 25 free hours per week, what would you do or something? Or if you had uh, additional income, what would you do? But uh, we'll see what, what the right question would be. Thank you. We have two questions specifically for Esther. Um, do you mind that answer? Thank you. Uh, the first question. <clears throat> so, um, migration is a global challenge, right? And I believe we are all potential refugees. Something just happens overnight and you're on the move to the next country. So yes, I'm planning to uh, pilot this elsewhere because also my resource, the youth and the university students are everywhere. So. I'm definitely planning to pilot this somewhere else. Um, the other question is, okay, fast, off record, no, one's, no one wants to marry empowered women in Uganda. So that was off record. So the problem we find is, of course, stereotypes, you know, uh, debates that are actually at even my university are how are we going to deal with empowered women? You know, the world is scared, and I get why. I mean, look at me, I'm 21 and I'm sitting here. You should be scared. So, the, the other challenge is um, for a long time, women have been trying to find their seat on the table. And I get it, you know, men have been privileged for a long time, you know. So when we speak gender equality, it's something that people say, oh no, we're so tired of this, you know. You know, now that we're pushing women so much, we're going to reach a time when now we have to push the men. I hear you, I get it. But why we're having this talk is because for a long time, women have not had a seat on the table. And we just pushed ourselves there. We just forced ourselves to have a seat at the table. That's why we, we see some, most times where you see, okay, now women are so re represented in this parliament, we have two women MPs. And we say, now women are represented in parliament. So, us pushing ourselves on the table is a barrier. People see us as, people say feminists are angry. People say, people push for gender equality are, you know, insensitive, but stereotypes is our biggest challenge and uh, we have to keep pushing and changing people's perspective on Yeah. Thank you so much. And um, we have a question here at the front. At first, thank you for these presentations. And uh, it was me who came up with question on serial was. Uh, I didn't mean to send it anonymously. <laughs> uh, so I think that in case that you cannot uh, give zero uh, votes to one person, this new voting system is in favor of democratic parties. Because uh, if we uh, see two political systems in different countries, we can uh, come to conclusion that uh, usually democratic candidates is a result of some consensus, uh, of some controversy, but conservative candidates are usually represented uh, representing uh, one uh, point of view, but most conservatives are usually agree with this position. We can see the things in the United States, in Russia, everywhere. Like in Russia, we have dozens of oppositional <coughs> candidates, but they uh, receive like one percent of a uh, vote. But there is only one conservative uh, candidate. So in, I think that in this case, it's like a manipulation of votes in favor of the Democratic Party, because if you could have an opportunity to give civil votes to one person, then I think the current president in Czech Republic would win. Uh, exactly. Like if you could give more votes to one person, it completely uh, loses the point, right? Because uh, if, if you are a voter of, uh, let's say, 
Excuse me, or, or not concentration candidate like Zeman, as you would give all three votes to Zeman, so it would be pointless. But with your, with your democratic republic, I mean, the spectrum is not two dimensional, it's a multiple dimensional spectrum. Yeah? So, so, yes, in some sense, you say conservative. I would uh, more say non consensual okay? I wouldn't say that uh, conservative candidates uh, are, the, uh, in a sense, I agree with you, those who are more like, democratic candidates, meaning they, they are open uh, uh, to uh, more to consensus, uh, will have an advantage. Or in other words, again, a candidate who is uh, more consensual, who is attractive also to other people, not just as a first choice, but as a second or third choice, will have the advantage. So this will create, indeed, a natural pre-election coalition, as I will describe it. If there are presidential candidates, so they will, they might create pre-election coalitions, yeah, trying to uh, their, uh, motivate their voters to give uh, uh, the second and third vote to their coalition partners. Any other questions? Uh, any questions specifically for Jan Kuka? Is that yours? No? Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, recent uh, UN reports uh, show that uh, indigenous management of forests is the most effective for protection of carbon sequestration and just overall uh, protection. I was just curious how that balances in with, um, uh, with the points that you talked on, on the uh, biotic pump. Well, I'm not really uh, trying to argue that um, it is uh, more important than CO2 uh, agenda, but basically water is very substantial for our life, and uh, we we used to be taught uh, in a basic school how the circle of water globally exists. And if you do some sort of more sophisticated mathematical simulation of that process, you will find that it's C biotic pump, which was a result of, of theory, and that brought something to that consideration. And in fact, I didn't have time to show that effect uh, from measurement. Uh, that in fact is, is helping us to, to, to have a water in, in, on Earth. And we, we ought to really protect trees, uh, because that wasn't a tendency 20 years ago, as I, as I showed at the beginning. So that's a sus substantial, uh, one substantial message from that. The second is that at the beginning you have theory, at the end you have real, real effect for society. That is something which is, which is a global effect. Uh, could I just slightly comment also uh, the, the, the questions about an um, election, because as you uh, showed, I was also in politics, uh, in the 90s, uh, former academician and politician, diplomat, and so on. Everything what I did, I, I did with pleasure. Uh, we have to realize that there will never be absolutely correct voting system. We are talking about improvements. We are talking about something which will, in in some amount of people in, in countries particular countries change the system to, to let's say, to reach goals which we like to reach. But we have to also take into account the, the tradition of the country, how they are happy with that voting system they do have. We as a young democracy, we are still thinking whether our system is really good or not. This is quite similar to Aust uh, Australian uh, voting system. No, not the same thing. Definitely, it is the original version. I'm, I'm not <coughs> arguing against that. But, but we would have to, we would have to accept that there is no absolutely objective election system in democracy. There will always be a mistake. If I can comment on that, maybe uh, uh, I think that's. I mean, that's the nature of politics, right? That, that's, it's all about choices and decision making. And there's a lot of tensions. Yeah, there is, of course, uh, so-called arrow because of the PCRM, but uh, there's, of course, there cannot be nothing that's perfect. And that's not, even in mathematics, we have incompleteness, and everything is uh, things are perfect. But there, there can be a strict comparison, something can be strictly better. Yeah? Yeah. And, of course, there are situations 
uh, one system can be better in different situations. So, for example, there is a very, very good system called maturity judgment, which is quite, uh, quite an involved one, and it is, uh, it is a system where <coughs> for you, you, you rank each option. So, if there was working for people, for each person, you give a rank, let's say, between minus two and plus two. But it's extremely complicated. So, that's a system that's great for evaluating, for example, wires. For, for some expert commissions to do, it would be totally impractical uh, practical for the political use, even though theoretically, if people are perfect, theoretically it would be uh, very great. Uh, of course, so there is the point of simplicity. But let me just a uh, quick answer uh, to the uh, Austrian system. It's actually not similar. The Austrian system has a logical fault, it's actually very bad. Uh, and I can explain it later. But the reason why is that it's conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, even if, uh, even if uh, in the Austrian system, because you be frank, uh, it's not the rank is not bad. If you have, for example, border government system, they are good, but the, the weakness of the Austrian system is how it's calculated. The calculation is actually logically faulty, but that's, that's a beyond uh, this discussion. But let me please answer this is a very good question. Is a truly global approach possible for using innovation for social good? Um, <coughs> Uh, pardon, uh, there was a transparency. Sorry, sorry, uh, the transparency, I, uh, the question before, actually. Uh, do you believe that technology actually could make politics more transparent? And indeed, absolutely. That, that is one of the amazing features, uh, what we have. Now, imagine China, okay? And imagine now the assumption that people do have free access to the internet. So now with the decentralized objective technologies, we can just run a social game. And regardless of the Chinese government, unless it's a total dictator, right? unless they prohibit people uh, by brute force not to have sex access to the internet. But unless this happens, if people have free access to the internet, they can express their opinions. And if there is like a, a good social game properly done, not a binary yes or no, but multiple options, how, good, how you are satisfied with multiple options, we can have an objective uh, result which is not manipulatable. Like a Bitcoin, it is objective, if one cannot manipulate it. So it cannot be that the government is doing research and arguing that people are actually happy with this dictator or uh, somebody uh, doing this, what, what has been done in the past. We have an objective evaluation. So as soon as we are able to promote uh, the social games uh, uh, for many people so that it becomes normal, so that people do it, we can ask any question. We can ask question people, what do you think about that? Use it using decentralized technologies and we can have indeed objective answers, not manipulatable. Yeah. Uh, a final word to Jan, yeah. and we'll wrap it up. I would like to have a final word, but I just like to add that uh, in, in a working system, that the procedure is one, one part. The second part is information about people who are candidates. And then, then the technology can really play a very significant role. If everybody will have access to, to these technologies as represented, then you can more objectively decide to whom you will then vote, give, and um, that is very substantial that the technology can bring really kind of revolution. Great, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I think um, access has been touched upon in a couple of panels um, today and yesterday, so we appreciate that. Um, okay, thank you so much for all of your contributions, panelists. We appreciate the discussion. Let's have a round of applause.